Hey guys, Mr. Kennedy back with a little bit about chromosomes and we're going to be talking about these little guys down here in the bottom we would call fruit flies, which we're going to find out a little bit more about a little bit later. Well, first of all, let's talk about Mendel's theories. Mendel's theories of how things, how chromosomes had certain genes located on them was totally theory uh, or based out of something inanimate until uh, in 1902, the chromosome theory of inheritance came, was came about in which they actually saw genes have specific loci on chromosomes. Now, what that means is, if I have a chromosome here, right, there would be, this spot would be for a certain chromosome, let's say hair, which is a great one for me, right? Uh, and this one down here would be maybe eye color or whatever. Uh, on the diagram here, you can see that they've used uh, fluorescent uh, dye to show where these specific chromosome pairs are. And, you know, this is just the first proof that what Mendel was saying was actually true. Now, a man named Thomas Morgan actually started doing studies on fruit flies, or Drosophila melangastra, um, in the early 1900s. Now, the, the unique thing is, Mendel used pea plants, and there was a lot of varieties of pea plants from where farmers and different growers had made different pea plants that so was easy for him to manipulate. Now, what what um, Thomas Morgan did was he took a fruit fly, which was basically red-eyed and normal wing, uh, body shape, kind of like the one over here on the left, and he wondered if he could make different varieties. So he started a process of mating these fruit flies and, and anesthetizing them and searching through them and trying to find uh, a mutant or some kind of variation. And it's said that he went for about two years and didn't find anything. And all of a sudden, he found this guy right here. This, this little wide-eyed fruit fly appeared in the population. And this wide-eyed fruit fly was a male. Now... This was mind-blowing to Thomas Morgan that he actually found what he was looking for, but he, he didn't stop there. He actually went and he figured out something called sex-linked genes. Uh, and what he did was this. He said that if white eye is recessive, so we're going to use uh, a little R here for white-eyed, and he took a boy and he crossed it with a red-eyed female. Now, if you do your Punnett square, down here, what you get if you do your punnett square, what you get is females that are heterozygous, right? I should be an X with a little R. And you get males that are red-eyed. So when he did his first cross, all the offspring appeared to be red-eyed. But now he didn't stop there. What he did was he took he took one of the red-eyed females, which was heterozygous, and he crossed it with a red-eyed male. And what he discovered was that the females still had red eyes, but the wide-eyed trait reappeared right here, right? The white-eyed trait reappeared, and it was only in males. So, and the more he did these studies, he realized that it, it really only appeared in the males that he was doing it on. So he said that the expression of the white-eyed must be linked to the sex of the fruit fly. So that's where the first idea of sex-linked traits came about. Now, we know in humans we have a lot of different sex-linked traits today. Color blindness, for example, it occurs more often in males than it does females. Uh, Duchenne's muscular dystrophy is a sex-linked trait. Uh, it occurs more in males than females. That's a weakening or deterioration of the, mu of the muscle cells. Uh, hemophilia, the bleeding disease, uh, find and more in males than female. Now, I might have explained it in regular biology this way. Males have only one X, so if we get a bad or recessive trait, it shows up. Females have two Xs, so for them to show up, it has to come from mom and dad. So down here I've written, mom can give these disorders to both the boy and the girl, right? Dads, however, can only pass it on to their daughters. So if you look at this dad over here, this dad has red eyes. That's what he passes on to both daughters. All right, the, 
whatever dad has is what he is going to end up passing on. So, like for example, male pattern bonus is sex linked. If you are a guy and you want to know if you're going to have hair or not when you get older, you don't look at your dad. You look at your mom because your dad doesn't pass on the X to you. Your mom does. All right. Now, it's something something unique about this is that females have two X's. Now, if you would think they have two X's, boys have one X. So a female is XX and a boy is XY. If this information on the X is coding for proteins, you would think females have twice as much, right? Times two. Well, what ends up actually happening in mammals is that one of these X's will become inactivated. And only this X will produce the proteins that are located on the X. Now, this X that's inactivated is called a bar body. It actually condenses into what's called a bar body. And, and it's, it ends up making some unique characteristics because if you're a cell that originates from this X from the female, from the mom, from this X here, you will express that in all the mitotic divisions that occur after. If you express with this X that comes from your dad, you will express all that in my top divisions. What happens is you don't never know because a female, right, if she got this X and this X, one from mom, one from dad, she gets two X's, right? If the one from mom is being expressed, it could give you one phenotype, and the one from dad being expressed could give you another. Examples in cats. Uh, if the one from mom has orange fur, and the one from dad has black fur, you could end up being a, what's called a tortoiseshell cat like this. You see where the orange just showed up in a patch? That's just being expressed from the mom, in my case. And the black showing up, that's from the, from the dad. That's what gives them that mosaic look if they're a heterozygote. It's kind of interesting how that came about. You even can get calico, which would be an additional white, which would be even more genes. But that just shows you a little bit about sex-linked genes. All right, now... Thomas Morgan went a little bit further. He said that he thought that genes were linked together, and he had created some flies. Like, he took a fly that was gray body and normal wing, when both of these were dominant traits. So let's use a big G, big G, uh, big N, big N. And he crossed it with a black body and a vestigial. Vestigial just means it had a little bit different wing on it. And let's say both of those were recessed. And well, now, I hope you know that if he crossed those, Every individual he got was like this, the heterozygous individual. It's still going to appear gray and have normal wings right here. Now, he didn't stop there, though. He crossed it once again with a recessive individual in a test cross. And what he expected to happen was that he was going to get uh, these individuals here. Let's see. Big G. Little G. Little N, uh, little G, little G, big N, little N, and little G, little G, little N, little N. He got these four individuals here, and he expected them in Mendelian genetics that would be 25%, 25%, 25%, 25%, right, doing a 16 square opponent square. But that's not what occurred. What actually occurred was that he ended up with 42% that were wild type red and normal wings, 41% that were black vestigial, 9% that were gray vestigial, and 8 that were um, black and normal. Now, so that ends up with a higher percentage being the per looking just like the parents did, and then you had these recombinants, which were made up of mom and dad right at a lower percentage so that told him that some genes must be linked for some reason this color body color and wing must be linked together they're being um separated independently because mendelian genetics if these four things were on four different chromosomes we would expect a 25 percent 25 percent 25 percent 25 percent but we didn't get that so they must be linked in some way so that talked about genes being linked together and morgan helped figure that out as well all right, and that led to a couple of things. We got to remember that 
how to explain it not being exactly 50-50 is that crossing over must be occurring. Now, you know, that's when we talked about in the last chapter or two when the chromosomes lay over each other and they exchange genetic information. Uh, one of his students went a little bit further and actually said we can actually predict what the chances of this crossing over occurring is, and he created what's called gene maps, all right, the recombination frequency. And there's an example of a gene map right down here, all right, and you can see that it has three genes, B, C, N, and V, G. And between these two genes, there's about 9 and 9.5% um, distance, a unit map it's between the two. And between B and V, G, there's like a 17 or 18.5% uh, distance between the two. Now, he, he said these are linkage maps. According to um, Morgan, um, Thomas Morgan's student, B and VG would have a greater chance, a 17% chance of crossing over, or genetic recombination where they lay it over, than B and CNN or CNN and VG independently. He said that the further away genes are, because crossing over happens randomly, the more likely they are to occur, which makes kind of sense. Okay. All right, now... Sometimes we have errors occur, and I want to just go through a few errors that may occur during genetics. We have non-disjunction. Non-disjunction usually happens, if you remember, chromosomes line up down the middle. One chromosome goes this way. One chromosome goes that way. You know, well, non-disjunction occurs when, for some reason, both of these go the same way. And you're going to end up with abnormal numbers of chromosomes in the cells that are produced. You have what's called an aneuploidy which is abnormal. Now, monosomy means it's missing one chromosome. For us, that would mean you would have 45 chromosomes instead of 46. Trisomy would mean you have one too many, which would be 47 chromosomes for us, be like in Down syndrome. And polyploidy would mean you'd have an extra set of chromosomes. So you'd have like 48 in polyploidy. Um, now, let's talk about each one of these real briefly. Um, Down syndrome, for example, is when you have three number 21 chromosomes. And as you see down here on this karyotype, it's really easy to identify. You can see where the three number 21 chromosomes are. Now, it usually increases in frequency with mother's age. And there's about one in every 700 children in the United States are born this way. So it's kind of a high frequency if you think about it. Now, antipolity of sex chromosome does occur too. That means you might have too many X's or too many Y's. Uh, one such sex chromosome antifluidy is Kleinfelder syndrome. That's a person who ends up having two X's and one Y. This would be a male. They might have a little bit feminine characteristics. They would have normal male organs, uh, but that would be sterile. Now, there's some other ones that we might need to know, too, like an XYY male might be taller than normal, have extra Y chromosome. Trisomy X female, um, you know, they, they're Totally healthy females. They might be a little bit larger than normal, but you wouldn't be able to tell the difference. Uh, monosomy is Turner syndrome. They have only one X chromosome. They're usually fertile, uh, immature females. They don't have uh, the female organs don't develop as well, like the, the breasts. Uh, they're usually flat chested, etc. So there are errors there. Uh, another error that may occur is actually in the chromosomes, where part of one chromosome segregates independent or flip flops, like. Down here, I've got several cases like deletion. You can see the D's here, and it's gone. Duplication, B and C are recopied. Inversion, they flip-flop. Right? Translocation, they actually move from one chromosome to another. All of these would be altercations of the chromosome, which would have an, an effect, of course. All right. And the last thing is called genomic imprinting. Now, what I've talked mostly about, a while ago with sex link chromosomes and stuff like that. These are going to occur in your autosomes, pairs 1 through 22. And it's whenever, depending on which parent gives you the gene, it depends on how it's expressed. So it may express differently in males if, a, if the daddy gives it to you or if the mom. An example is fragile X syndrome. If the daddy gives it to you, uh, then you have a higher likelihood, if you're a male, of it showing up and being like a retardation or, um, you know, have a higher, higher chance of getting it. But anyway, I hope this helps, and I will talk to you soon.